I'm at my limit. The hostess looked at me with tear-swollen eyes. Leave it to me, I said. When I gazed at her, she lowered her eyes and blushed, saying, I've never seen something this magnificent before. I never thought I'd use this again. My heart started pounding as I held the familiar object in my hand. While setting up a tent by the lake and fishing, I heard the sound of an ambulance in the distance. I didn't pay much attention and continued fishing, but the siren kept getting closer. When I turned around, I saw an ambulance parked in front of a building I thought was abandoned on the opposite shore. I'd been camping here for three days, enjoying solo camping and fishing. The building didn't look like a regular house, it resembled a lodge or a drive-in, with no cars or people coming in or out. And no lights on at night, so I assumed it was an abandoned place. An ambulance means someone was there. Could it be that someone died in the empty building? There have been a lot of alarming news stories lately. If my guess was right, I've been camping next to a place where someone might have died for three days. Maybe I should move to another spot. This is creeping me out. I felt a chill run down my spine. Eventually, the ambulance drove away, probably with someone inside. It was too far to see the details from here. All right, I'll stay one more night and then leave this place. I decided and started preparing dinner by the lake. My name is David, and I'm a 40-year-old unemployed man. I skillfully started a fire, cleaned the fish I caught with a small knife, salted them, and put them on the fire. For sides, I seasoned leafy vegetables I bought at a nearby farmer's market with just olive oil and salt and pepper. Tonight's dinner was perfectly grilled fish, some cheese from a convenience store, and a salad of fresh local vegetables. Accompanied by a glass of hot whiskey, which I allowed myself. As the sun set, I felt a bit of peace return to my heart while enjoying the meal by the fire. In the past, I used to be particular about the origin of ingredients and believed that good food had to be expensive. But now, fish caught in an unnamed lake and cheese from a convenience store tasted incredibly good. The lake, reflecting the red hues of the sunset, was calm, and I could hear the cawing of crows. The shouts echoing in the kitchen, the clattering of dishes. And the mix of various food aromas in the heated environment, all those memories of my hectic life seemed like a distant dream. I've been living this way for eight months now. I wasn't always unemployed. I used to be the head chef at a five-star hotel restaurant in New York. After high school, I went to culinary school to learn the basics of cooking, and after graduating, I moved overseas to train at a restaurant in Paris for 10 years. At the restaurant, I honed my skills daily as the right-hand man of the owner chef, learning French to blend into the local lifestyle. Just as I was considering staying in Paris, a mentor from culinary school invited me back to the States. At 30, I was appointed as the head chef at the five-star hotel restaurant. I wonder why I decided to return. What would my life be like if I had stayed in Paris? I ponder these thoughts while watching the crackling fire. I once dated a French colleague, but we didn't marry, she later married another Frenchman and left the culinary world. If I had stayed in Paris, I might be married and be a father, possibly running my own small restaurant. But the reason I'm in this situation now is entirely my own doing. I realized this only after becoming an unemployed, single middle-aged man. When I ruled the kitchen like a king, I never doubted myself. What am I thinking about now? I should go to bed. I started this wandering lifestyle in early spring. It's now late autumn. The air has become colder in the mornings and evenings, and I'm getting drunk faster than usual tonight. Shivering as I looked at the old building where the ambulance had been, I quickly crawled into my sleeping bag. I woke up to the chirping of birds. The next morning, when I stepped out of the tent, I saw someone at the entrance of that dilapidated building. Hmm. Looks like a woman. Before leaving, I decided to ask if there were other places nearby where I could set up my tent and fish. I packed up the tent, loaded it into the back of my van, and gathered my belongings. When I visited the building on the other side of the lake, I was surprised. Lakeside Inn, Parker? So, it's an inn. But it looks so run down. Without the sign at the entrance, I would have never guessed it was an inn. Excuse me, is there something you need? While I was looking at the building, a woman, who seemed to have noticed me, approached. Her hair was tied back, and she wore no makeup, but she was beautiful and looked at me with a furrowed brow. I'd been camping by the lake for three days, and I planned to leave soon. 
I was wondering if there are any other places nearby where I can set up my tent and fish. Oh, you're a camper. There's been a camping boom lately, and weekends are in quite bustle around here. Because of that, our rundown in isn't doing well. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to complain. I could sense a hint of resignation in her attitude. I'm not one of those trendy solo campers. I'm a drifter, camping out wherever I go. If I'd known this was an inn, I might have stayed. But I didn't realize it was one. No, I'm not blaming you. I'm sorry for being harsh. I'm dealing with a lot right now. She trailed off. Yesterday, an ambulance came here. Is that related to what's going on? I asked her. Yes. My father felt unwell yesterday, so we called an ambulance. I'm here to pick up his hospital bag. I'm in a hurry, so I'm sorry. Oh. A place to set up your tent, right? It's about a 30-minute drive from here. She started to explain while looking at a map app on her phone, but I stopped her. No, it's fine. I'll stay here a bit longer. Maybe I can help you with something. Please contact me when you're back from the hospital and have things settled. I handed her my phone number and email address. She contacted me the next day. When I visited the inn, she looked extremely tired, probably from lack of sleep. How is your father doing? I asked her. He's stable now. He has heart problems and occasionally has to rush to the hospital. This time it's for a checkup. So it might take longer than usual. It's a problem because we have a reservation for tomorrow and I need to call the guests to cancel. She sighed and hung her head. Then, she tucked her loose bangs behind her ear and introduced herself. My apologies for the late introduction. I'm Emily. I introduced myself as well. She explained that the inn only operates on weekends, holidays, and during long breaks. Since I had set up my tent on a weekday, there were no lights on. Yesterday, her father, who was the chef, had been bringing ingredients into the kitchen in preparation for the weekend. But he had felt chest pains in the kitchen. Could you wait on contacting the guests? Let me handle it. What? You? Emily gave me a look as if I were joking. This place might be run down, but my father is a skilled chef. Cooking for yourself while camping is entirely different. I sensed a bit of anger in her tone. If it's all right, may I see the kitchen? When I asked, she agreed to show me inside the inn. This place may look old, but it's well maintained. I commented as I looked around, speaking to her back. Thank you. My parents started this inn when they got married, and I grew up here. That's why I take good care of it. She turned and smiled at me. Although it was a 50-year-old wooden building, the floors and pillars were polished and shiny. When I was shown the kitchen, I could imagine the chef at work. The tools were well maintained, and the dishes were neatly arranged. The commercial refrigerator doors and stainless steel work tables were spotless, exuding a sense of cleanliness. The floor, likely scrubbed with a special cleaner and brush after each use, had no trace of slipperiness and felt immaculate. Chefs can often tell a lot about a colleague's work ethic and even their personality by glancing at their kitchen. The owner of Lakeside Inn, Parker, seemed to be a true artisan, genuinely dedicated to his craft. We used to be open year-round. When I was a child, I often helped out because we were short-handed. But then a fancy hotel and a stylish campsite opened nearby, and we lost customers. Emily said with a sad expression, and continued. Now we only get enough guests for my father and me to handle. But with him hospitalized, it might be time to consider closing down for good. I'm at my limit. Emily bit her lip hard and then broke into tears. I placed my attaché case on the workbench and unlocked it. Inside was my collection of beloved knives. There were several well-used, high-quality knives, and I took each one out in turn. Each knife felt perfectly familiar in my hand. Emily's eyes widened in surprise. I'd never seen such fine knives before. They're custom-made and I've been using them for years. Want to try holding one? I handed Emily a knife by the handle. Wow, it's heavy. Much heavier than my father's knives. Are you a chef too, David? She looked up at me curiously. 
I used to be the head chef at a five-star hotel restaurant in New York. When she asked for the hotel name, I didn't see a reason to hide it, so I told her. Emily looked astonished. And rightly so. It's a well-known hotel that anyone would recognize. How did someone like you end up here? Emily asked, peering into my face. After returning to the States and being appointed head chef at the renowned hotel restaurant, I was eager to introduce recipes, ingredients, and techniques I learned in Paris. Can we change the source of the vegetables? The greens lack flavor. We need to upgrade the quality of the beef. The lighting in the restaurant is all wrong. The food doesn't look appetizing. The timing of the sauce application is terrible. Is this how it's always been done? Who made today's staff meal? It's awful. My demands extended not only to the kitchen staff but also to the management. David, I understand your skills from your time abroad, but ingredient costs are rising, and this isn't sustainable," said Michael, the general manager, with a troubled look. Then let's revise the menu prices. Even with a 20% increase, my cooking will keep the customers coming. I said confidently, pressing him. That's difficult. Michael replied, looking grim. David, Paris trained or not, you're overdoing it. Yeah, even with your skills, your attitude is a problem. His approach doesn't encourage learning. He should just leave. I knew I was seen as a demanding person and disliked by many, but I didn't care. I was confident in my abilities and believed those who wanted to learn from me should take the opportunity. I genuinely thought that way. I still think that way, but I do wonder if I could have communicated better. Back then, I behaved like a king. Eventually, some staff members began to suffer from stress-related issues and quit. One was diagnosed with a mental illness, and their family held the management accountable. The management, seeing the seriousness of the situation, decided to let me go to prevent further resignations. Thus, I took responsibility and was dismissed. I interviewed at several restaurants, but my impressive resume made it difficult for smaller establishments to hire me. Moreover, my demanding nature had made me notorious in the industry, especially among hotel restaurants, where I was seen as a high-risk hire. Unable to secure a new job, I gradually fell into depression. My behavior had spread misery and negatively impacted my life. I began to blame myself. While I had unwavering confidence in my cooking skills, I had plenty of reasons to doubt my personality. I became so anxious that I couldn't leave the house, but after months of being a recluse, I started worrying about my neighbor's judgment. So, I embarked on an indefinite, aimless journey. When I shared my story with Emily, she listened intently. Despite not being good at talking to people, I found myself pouring out my life story to someone I had just met. Maybe it was because I hadn't spoken to anyone since quitting my job, but I felt a bit lighter after sharing my feelings. I'm sorry for unloading all this on you. I said, with an apologetic smile. Not at all. Admitting your faults is not easy. I'm sure your future will be brighter. Emily said with a gentle smile. Oh, um, shall we discuss tomorrow's menu? Trying to hide my flushed face, I changed the subject. First, we used Emily's phone to have a video call with her hospitalized father. I am truly sorry for asking a stranger for such a favor. Emily told me you were the head chef at a famous hotel for 10 years. If you don't mind. I'd like you to manage the kitchen until I recover. Please, I'm counting on you. Her father said weakly. We immediately started working on the menu. Although there was already a menu plan that Emily's father had prepared, I didn't have the detailed recipes. Given the freedom to make changes, I decided to stick to the plan menu but add French-inspired touches to the dishes. Let me know if there's anything I can help with. Emily said. Can you peel these taro roots? Sure. Together, we prepped and prepared the ingredients. Before we knew it, it was getting dark outside. Aren't you hungry? I'll make something with what we have, I offered. Really? That would be wonderful. I whipped up two dishes and a soup with the available ingredients, and we ate in the kitchen. This is delicious. I can't believe you made such amazing food with just the basics. You're the real deal, David. As I watched Emily's joyful reaction, I recalled similar moments from my past. 
When I worked at the high-end hotel restaurant, I was told countless times, it was delicious. After guests finished their meals, I would visit their tables and receive countless compliments. I felt proud and believed it was only natural for the head chef to get all the compliments from the guests directly. As I thought that I was the one creating the menus and recipes and training the staff. I took it for granted. But now, I realized something. I was just representing the team in front of the guests. Back then, I had a spacious kitchen with the latest equipment, high-end ingredients, and many subordinates. The restaurant had marble floors, expensive plates, and fine wines. Now, here I am, in the small, modest kitchen of an old inn on the brink of closing, sharing a simple meal with Emily. David? What's wrong? Are you not satisfied with the taste? Oh, no, I was just lost in thought, I replied. I found myself thinking about my former subordinates who had worked so hard. Especially those who couldn't handle my strictness and ended up leaving. I wondered how they were doing now. Come on, David. We still have some prep to finish. Let's eat quickly. Emily said, snapping me back to reality. You're right. Let's give it one more push. I said, stuffing the remaining food into my mouth. We finished all the preparations by around 10 p.m. I had planned to pitch my tent by the lake again, but Emily offered me a room in the inn. Tomorrow, we'll finally welcome guests. I'm a bit nervous. I lay in bed, unable to sleep. I hadn't felt like this in decades. It was like being a rookie all over again. While I was nervous about serving guests again, the anxiety of being the only one in charge was new to me. In Paris, and even after returning to the US, I always had colleagues and subordinates around me. I never realized how invaluable those who could anticipate my needs were. Being without them felt incredibly lonely. I never thought I'd come to understand this now. The next evening, it was time to welcome the guests. David, you're fidgeting and can't stay still. Pull yourself together. Emily urged me. Right, I might be a temporary chef but the guests don't care about that. I took a deep breath and welcomed the arriving guests. Welcome. We've been expecting you. Wait, are you David? A young male guest called out to me. It is you. What are you doing here? Seeing his face, I was so shocked I couldn't speak. Jake. Jake was a former subordinate who quit after only three months because of my strictness. I had heard he suffered from a mental illness because of me and was undergoing treatment, but I didn't know what happened after I left. Are you well? No, that's not right. Long time no see? That doesn't fit either. I was literally at a loss for words. I heard you got fired because of me, and I was worried. I can't believe we're meeting here. Are you the one cooking today? Well, yes. Jake's unexpected words left me even more speechless. While Emily showed Jake and his friends to their room, I started cooking in the kitchen. Emily soon joined me to help. You know, David, that boy Jake asked if I was your wife. Emily said, blushing. Well, you are younger than me, after all. I replied, flustered. Holding the knife, I felt a sense of awe at working in the kitchen again. Having a place to show off my cooking skills, guests who appreciate the food, and colleagues to work with. I took all that for granted, I thought. With Emily's help, I finished preparing the dishes and brought them to the waiting guests. Wow, David's cooking is amazing as always. Jake exclaimed in admiration. His friends echoed similar sentiments, taking photos of the dishes and saying it was too beautiful to eat. After introducing myself as the head chef, the party started. As I was about to leave, Jake offered me a drink, which I gratefully accepted. I'm working at an Italian restaurant now. I'm the chef and manager. Jake said, smiling and updating me on his life. When he worked for me, he was always scared, and I hardly ever saw him smile or even heard his voice clearly. I'm truly sorry about back then. I've regretted driving you to that point and ruining your life. I said, sincerely. I was scared of you and didn't like you, but I loved the food you made. I still respect you as a chef. I'm enjoying my work now. So please don't worry. Jake said, offering me another drink. Although I couldn't simply feel happy, knowing I had driven him to a mental breakdown, 
seeing his smile brought me some peace. The next day, Emily and I saw Jake and his friends off. Waving, Jake said, David, your cooking is the best. I'll be back. After we saw Jake and his group off, Emily turned to me and said, What are you going to do? Jake said he's coming back to eat your food again. What? What do you mean, what am I going to do? I looked at her in surprise. Of course, once your father comes back, I'll leave. And don't worry, I'll make sure to get paid for my work. I need funds for my travels. I said with a smile. Emily laughed along with me. Overcoming this challenge together seemed to have created a sense of camaraderie between us. Until your father returns. I reiterated to Emily. Then, until then, I want to eat a lot of your cooking. I can't forget the taste of your dishes, she said. The taste of my dishes. I chuckled. All right, I'll cook breakfast, lunch, and dinner until then. I suggested to Emily, pulling myself together. Yay! Emily said, making a cute fist pump. Afterward, Emily took me to visit her father in the hospital to report on our successful work. It looked like her father would be in the hospital for about a month. Even after being discharged, it wasn't clear if he could return to the kitchen. At their request, I agreed to stay at the inn and take charge of the kitchen. I didn't know what the future held, but for now, I decided to stay here and help. We have another group reservation for next week. If your cooking gains a reputation, we might be able to open every day again. Not just on weekends. Emily said, looking up at me. With Emily in the passenger seat, I drove toward our immediate workplace, the Lakeside Inn, Parker. It wasn't the glamorous kitchen I used to work in, but maybe this lifestyle wasn't so bad after all. Emily, when we get back, let's have lunch and plan the menu for next week's group together, I suggested. Yes. I smiled back at her and pressed the accelerator.